Well, as you take a seat, go ahead and open your Bibles with me, if you will, to <clears throat> Acts chapter 22. And as you do, I want to again welcome you all this morning. It's good to have each and every one of you with us today. If you are a guest with us or would like more information, you can fill out one of our Connect cards, look at it on the back table. Um, you can ask for one if you don't know where to find them. We'll be happy to help you out. But especially want to, to welcome uh, David and April Johnson with us this morning and their, their family. It is good to have uh, them back with us this morning from Memphis, Tennessee, um, the land of good barbecue. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, David was on staff with us from 2019 to 2022, serving as a role of associate pastor before moving back to Memphis, Tennessee to take a a similar role in a great church there um, in Memphis. And so we want to welcome them back today. Hopefully they have a good time away and go back refreshed and uh, ready to serve the Lord in, in Memphis. Um, another uh, announcement in the life of our church that we're excited about. And next week we will be having a, a vote of whether or not to affirm Jim Creech as, as an elder uh, to um, our elder team here at the, the church. So covenant members, if you have not had a chance to get to know Jim yet, please encourage you to do so. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, please talk to one of uh, the current elders uh, prior to next week. We'll be happy to address any questions or concerns that you may have, uh, but we'll have a, a vote immediately following the service next Sunday um, for that. But as we set our hearts and minds to think about our text this morning, I think we're all well aware that life isn't fair, right? I'm going to ask that again. <laughs> we're all well aware that life is not fair, correct? Yes. All right. we, we learn this from uh, an early age, experience this from an early age, that life itself is, is full of injustices, which children is another way of saying life's not fair, <laughs> We, we, whether you're young or old, we, can, we recognize this, we experience this. And, and as God teaches us very clearly throughout the scriptures, anyone seeking true justice in this world will not find it outside the cross of Christ. Just not going to find it outside the cross of Christ. Now, this isn't to say that we should not pursue or advocate for, for justice or, or we shouldn't long for justice. We, we should, we very much should. The, the Lord telling us in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17, to, to learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. But what I want us to think about this morning is how we're to live in a world of, of injustice. That is, when we experience things in life that just aren't fair, when we're the ones on the receiving end of various injustices, how should we respond? Better, better yet, how are we able to faithfully follow Jesus while experiencing uh, life or living life in a world that is full of injustice? How? Well, to get a glimpse into the answer, because we could probe this for a very long time, but to get a glimpse into the answer, let's look together at Acts chapter 22, uh, beginning in verse 22. We're going to go all the way through chapter 3, so a bit lengthy reading, but this is where Paul has been arrested by the Roman officials in Jerusalem and is giving his defense before the Jewish religious council and in this defense, verse 22, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. <clears throat> but when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to, to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, 
what are you about to do? (laughs) For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came to him and and said to him, tell me, are, are you a Roman citizen? And he, being Paul, said, yes. The tribune answered, I I, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, no, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, we, we find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. When it was day, the the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 men who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and, going aside, asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush to, for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius, Lysias, to the excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. 
This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him. Having learned that he was a Roman citizen and desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instruction, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, They presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. So I know that's a lot to take in. But but in summary of, of what we have taking place here, in all of these verses, Paul, in his return to Jerusalem, has been unjustly arrested. His life is being threatened on the basis of false accusations. Plots are being made against his life. People vowing that we will not eat or sleep until we kill him. And yet, through all the injustice he's experienced, Here's Paul still striving to faithfully follow Jesus. He's still seeking to to faithfully testify to the gospel of the grace of God. With Jesus now telling him he must testify in Rome just as he has in Jerusalem. And again, the question that as I studied this and think about this that just continues to permeate through my mind is, is how? That is how are Christians to to faithfully follow Jesus, not only in a world of injustice, but while actively experiencing injustice. But while actively experiencing such persecution as this, like what does this look like? How is it done? And, And I believe it starts with not being naive to the reality that Christians will experience injustice. We can't be naive to this reality. We're we're not in any way immune from experiencing injustice just because we're Christians. Again, we look at what Paul experienced. From the threats against his life to, to being arrested, to the high priest commanding for Paul to be struck across the face. You know, telling the horrible things that were said about him and jeered at him from the crowd. I mean, just imagine if social media had existed back then. And that's just what's happened since he's returned to Jerusalem. That doesn't take into effect, it doesn't take into account what's taking place, what he's experienced over the last quarter of a century of being a believer and faithfully, seeking to faithfully follow Christ. And again, here the question is why? Why has Paul been treated this way? Why would they treat him or anyone this way? For one simple reason, because he's attempting to faithfully follow Jesus. That's why he's been treated this way. See, don't forget or or understand, this is how Jesus was treated as well. Jesus being the the truly innocent one who, who never sinned. Yet he was still slandered. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was arrested. He was killed. Jesus experiencing the greatest injustice the world has ever known or will ever know. And anyone who seeks to faithfully follow Jesus should expect nothing less. As Jesus told his disciples in John 15, 18 through 21, you'll see it on the screen. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. 
A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. See, if we're seeking to faithfully follow Jesus, we should expect to be treated unfairly in this world just as Jesus was treated unfairly. As injustice paves the way on the road that we seek to walk. Now, that's not to say that we should seek out injustice in some warped sense of a martyr complex. We should not. But neither should we be surprised when we experience injustice in our life. As faithfulness to Christ will bring unjust responses from the world in which we live. People will treat us unfairly. They will say things about us that are not true. They will mock us. They will issue threats and any number of other things in an attempt to silence the gospel witness. And yes, it will hurt. Whoever made up the saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That person was a liar because words hurt. And words can hurt deeply. I mean, truth be told, the person who first said this was actually probably somebody who was hurt very deeply by someone else's words and was putting up a wall of defense in order to protect themselves. They're still hurt. See, we can't think for a moment that Paul wasn't hurt by the words and actions of the people. Many of them who he knew from his past These are not strangers, by and large, for Paul. All of this had to hurt. Also can't think that Jesus wasn't hurt by the injustices that he experienced when those closest to him rejected him, said hurtful things about him, made plots against his life. Remember, Jesus was fully human and knew exactly what it was like to be despised and rejected by men as he himself was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Friends, there's no way around it. To experience any form of injustice is to experience some form of hurt. So then the question is, how are we to respond when we experience such injustice? When we are hurt in such a way, how are we then to respond? And the answer is simple, but yet difficult to apply. Christians must respond to injustice like Jesus. Will we do so perfectly? (laughs) No, not at all. But if we're seeking to faithfully follow Jesus, we must seek to respond to injustice in a way that Jesus would have responded. Not letting our emotions lead the way, but rather a faithfulness to God's word. Jesus over and over channeling his his anger, now that his anger being a, a righteous anger throughout his life without sin, but he's always channeling his righteous anger in righteous ways with righteous responses directed by God's word, sometimes even remaining completely silent, which has to be one of the most difficult things to do, right? Like to have somebody speaking ills against you, hurtful things against you, you're experiencing injustices and to stay silent and not speak in your own defense, to not retaliate. But consider with me a few examples from our text that highlight Paul's attempt to respond like Jesus. Notice how Paul appeals to the law. So like Jesus, Paul was unjustly arrested and unjustly treated, yet never speaks against the government or at any time tries to revolt against the government. What did he do instead? He appeals to the law as a source of God-ordained protection. In this case, not the Torah, but the Roman law. Appealing to, on the basis of his Roman citizenship, appealing based on his rights as a citizen of Rome. So here was Paul about to be flogged by the hands of the Roman officials in chapter 22, verse 25, and, and asked, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Why does Paul ask this question? Because Paul already knew the answer to this question. 
No, it is not lawful to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't been proven guilty of a crime. Which is why the, they immediately stopped when they found this out. They, they pulled back, they, they themselves fearful of what might happen to themselves if they continued forth. Thus, Roman law actually serving to protect uh, Paul in this situation, preventing a future injustice. Now with this, did Jesus appeal to the law in the same way that Paul did? No, he did not. But there's a reason why he did not. Because Jesus was not a Roman citizen like Paul. Meaning he did not have the same legal rights under the, the law of the land as Paul did which itself highlights the, that injustice exists in this world where image bearers of God born in different parts of the world face various levels of injustices every single day simply because they were born in a different country, born under different laws. There's nothing fair about it at all. Yet when we look at how Jesus responded to the injustice that he experienced, did Jesus seek to revolt against the government or seek to circumvent the law in order to fight the injustice that he was experiencing? No. What did Jesus do instead? He just kept doing what was right according to God's word. And he kept doing what was right according to God's word, no matter the cost. See, scripture teaches us that, that governments and institutions are established by, by God. Meaning even the most unjust of governments continue to exist because God himself ordains them to continue to exist. If he didn't have a plan for them to be there, they wouldn't be there, plain and simple. Take the Roman government, for example. It will later show brutal persecution, great injustice against the church. Emperor Nero having Christians burned like tiki torches to, to light up his garden. And yet it was during the reign of Nero that Paul tells the church in Rome, in Romans 13, 1 through 2, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. This being a passage that we're tempted to read and want to insert our own clauses. Ah, but, ah, except, ah, um, unless, only when, if, and, and we fail to hear what's being said in the context in which it's being said. Let every person be subject to Emperor Nero. Now, does this mean do everything Nero says without question? No, it does not. Why? because God's law supersedes the law of any earthly government. Meaning if, if the law of the land instructs us to bow to the idols of this world, like we see with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how they were told to do so, or is told, we're told to, to violate God's law, then we must refuse to bow. But at the same time, we must expect injustice to take place in return. And if the law provides a means for appeal, provides a way that we can appeal to a right, then Paul, then like Paul, we have every right to appeal based on the laws of the land in which we live. Now, does this mean that then justice will be served? No, it doesn't mean that at all. We see such injustice stemming from governments all the time. And when this happens, as, as horrible as it is, how are we to respond by following the example of Jesus and continuing to do his right no matter the cost? Now to flush this out a little further, look with me how Paul lived his life before God in all good conscience. So like Jesus, Paul sought to do what was right makes his defense before the council in verse one of chapter 23 by saying, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Now, does this mean that Paul was saying that he was without sin? No, by no means. He himself states in other places that such a claim would have made him a liar. Of course, Paul sinned. And not just in, in his life before coming to faith in Christ, but in his everyday, day-to-day -day life after coming to faith in Christ. Paul was a, a sinner. 
Jesus was sinless. Paul was not. Paul recognized himself to be the worst of all sinners. So what Paul is saying here with, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day, is he's done nothing to provoke this riot that is taking place now in Jerusalem. He's done nothing to violate the Jewish law or the, the temple. He's had, not, he's had not broken any of Caesar's laws with all the accusations being levied at him that were reasons for his beating, the reasons for his arrest, the reason for the people who were plotting against him. In all of this, he was innocent. And with this, he had a clear conscience. Can't control the injustice that he's experiencing, but his conscience before God is clear. And friends, this is what matters. We can't control how others will respond. Can't guarantee governments will always act in in just ways that they won't. But we must always respond in such a way that will give us a clear conscience before God. No matter what the cost in this life is. Take this situation at hand. As Paul says, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day, testifying that he's done nothing wrong. And how does the high priest respond? Verse 2. Commanded those who stood by Paul to strike him on the mouth. Commanded to punch Paul across the face, smack him across the face, knock him across the face. Paul's speaking the truth, and yet he gets unjustly struck right across the face. So you think for a moment about this and put yourself in Paul's shoes and how would you be tempted to respond if that happened to you? How would you honestly want to respond in that moment with somebody punching you across the face when you've done nothing wrong? (laughs) I'm gonna wanna punch him back. I'm just being honest. I'm gonna wanna say something back in my own defense. Probably something that I shouldn't say. Why? Why? Because when I experience a perceived injustice, I want to respond in the flesh. I think all of us do. We want to respond in the flesh. I I, I want to enact my own justice. I want the wrong that has been made against me to be made right. And this is where we get a glimpse of Paul doing something similar. He gets struck across the face, looks directly at the high priest who gave the order and says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Paul's like, you hypocrite. You spiritually dead hypocrite. Because here's the significance behind Paul's use of calling the, the priest a whitewashed wall. See, the Jews would paint their tombs white as a warning. Because to touch a tomb was to bring defilement. So don't accidentally touch the tomb. Don't be defiled. Thus Paul's words to the high priest are saying, you may look white on the outside. You may look righteous on the outside. But everything in you is dead. All of which is certainly true. Everything Paul replied with was true. But then what happens, verse 4, those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? To which Paul responded, how? In verse 5, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler, uh, a ruler of your people. Paul was quick to repent here. Shows us how Paul was quick to repent. See, Jesus never needed to repent because Jesus never sinned. Jesus himself struck across the face when questioned by the high priest in John 18, 19 through 23, but he did not sin in his response. Paul did sin. How so? He went against God's word. Exodus chapter 22, verse 28, teaching that you shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. And when Paul realized that he had spoke against the high priest, he realized that he had sinned. He had gone against God's word. And we, like Paul, aren't always as slow to speak as we should, are we? May respond with the truth, but do so in ways that aren't appropriate. In this case, Paul speaks publicly against the high priest. He says he didn't know, so we're going to take his word for it that he didn't know, But either way, breaks the Jewish law. 
And then he calls, he's called on it. And he does what? Again, he quickly repents. A very needed reminder that as we seek to faithfully follow Jesus, we, we will sin. We will say and do things that aren't becoming of a follower of Christ. And when we do, we must be quick to repent. Can't control how another person is going to respond when we do repent. But we must continually seek to do what is right and operate with a a clear conscience before God. This is what we see from Paul. God's word being the the standard by which he lived his life. and, And when he violated it, he repented. Which is a question, is is that a pattern that marks our life? When we violate God's law, are we living a life of repentance? See, number four there, Paul strived to be faithful no matter the cost. Wasn't perfect by any means. But he strived to be faithful to Jesus no matter the cost. Jesus faithful all the way to the cross. And Paul striving to remain faithful to testify to the gospel of the grace of God to testify to the hope of the resurrected Jesus, no matter the cost. Paul, knowing the varying beliefs within the gathered assembly regarding the Old Testament teaching of a future resurrection, Pharisees believing in a future resurrection, the Sadducees not believing in a future resurrection. And what does Paul do in this moment after already being struck? He points to how the resurrection of Jesus is consistent with Old Testament teaching which has actually caused some of the scribes, these Pharisee scribes, these scholars to say, we find nothing wrong in this man. Asking, wondering, what if the spirit or an angel spoke to him? Now, this is by no means a profession of faith, but it is some serious pebbles being dropped in some shoes. He's giving them something to think about, something to discuss. But what happens next? The dissenting voices, they then become violent. Again, the tribune takes Paul away to the barracks so he's not torn to pieces for his own protection. Yet through it all, everything that's taking place, Paul is striving to remain faithful, to testify to the hope found in the resurrected Christ. He can't control how his listeners are going to respond. He's just striving to be faithful to what God has called him to do. Leaving us again with the question of how. How do we honestly do this in a world in which we live? In a world that makes faithfulness so difficult, is always pressuring us to compromise. A pressure that comes in so many ways to bow to man and not to, to God. How do we remain faithful when the cost of faithfulness within our culture only continues to grow? Well, number three, Christians must take courage in Christ. So with all the injustice Paul is experiencing, people looking literally to take his life, and we're told there in verse 11, the following night the Lord stood by him and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Now, a few things here, but first, the words take courage. I don't often highlight the original languages when I preach because I think that doing so can be confusing and instill an unhealthy distrust in our English translations. And and I'm very thankful for some of the excellent English translations that we have before us today that should be trusted. But in in the original Greek, the take courage or take heart is actually one word, not two. And it's a, it's a word that from all I can tell is, is used five times in the New Testament. And in each case, it's only used by Jesus. With each and every usage intended to bring great comfort to the recipient. The first being in Matthew chapter nine, verse two, where Jesus calls the, the bedridden paralytic, you remember that story? tells him to take heart, take courage, my son. Your sins are forgiven. Then in verse 22 of that same chapter, telling the woman experiencing the 12-year hemorrhage to take heart, to take courage, daughter. Your faith has made you well. 
And then to his frightened disciples, the night that he came to them walking on the the storm-tossed sea in Matthew chapter 14, verse 27, saying, take heart, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then in the upper room in John 16, 33, on the, the night of his crucifixion, he said, take heart, I have overcome the world. And then lastly, here in Acts, Jesus speaking to the apostle Paul and telling him, take courage. Why is he telling him to take courage? In what way is Paul to take courage? In knowing like the paralytic that his sins have been forgiven. In knowing like the woman, his faith has made him well, no matter what comes next. Knowing like the disciples in the storm-tossed sea, He has nothing to fear. And why does he have nothing to fear? Because as Jesus told the disciples in the upper room, he has overcome the world. He has overcome the storms of this world. Jesus has already defeated Paul's greatest enemies, sin and death. So take courage in me is the instruction that Paul has given. And church, this is the charge to each of us this morning as well. As we seek to faithfully follow Christ in a world filled with injustice, take courage in Jesus. Take courage in the promises that find their yes and amen in Jesus. Take courage in the hope of the resurrected Jesus who has already overcome the world and promises to make all the wrongs of this world right. And then lastly, Christians must trust in God's sovereign providence. See, after Jesus tells Paul to take courage, he tells him what? That as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so as you have faithfully testified to the truth of the gospel in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And what this is, is a sovereign must. Paul being told, as as you faithfully testify to the gospel in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Meaning he's going to Rome. Doesn't yet know how he's going to get there or what might happen to him along the way, but he's going to Rome. And what's he going to Rome to do? He's going to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He's going to keep doing what he's been doing. But then what happens next in the timeline? Well, we learn of a plot made to kill Paul, a plot Paul's nephew overhears. I didn't even know Paul had a sister or a nephew to this point, but the nephew overhears it, he appears. Verse 16 tells Paul, then long story short, the Roman tribune calls the Roman centurions to gather 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen to get Paul safely to Caesarea, where he'd have a hearing with essentially a a, a higher court. And he's going to be guarded. He's going to be protected. He's going to be kept safe from those who are looking to kill him. All this showing us and teaching us several different things. One, injustice is often used by God to proclaim the gospel to new audiences. We see it here with Paul and with countless others throughout history. God using our faithfulness in suffering to shine a bright light on his amazing grace, pointing others to the hope that is found in Jesus, not responding as the world would have us to respond, but continuing to testify to the hope of the resurrected Jesus, no matter the cost. Two, injustice does not fall outside of God's providence. Just as with the story of Joseph, Much of what Paul's experiencing is not fair. And he doesn't know what's going to happen next. But he trusts that God does. The divine must telling Paul he's going to Rome to testify the gospel. This is going to happen. But he doesn't know all that's going to happen to get him there. Which is why the only thing that Paul can do or is intended to do is to remain faithful in the here and now, trusting in God's providence. And friends, the same is true for us. 
We are to remain faithful, trusting in God's providence, doing what God has called us to do, no matter the cost. Three, yes, Paul knows that he must go to Rome to testify to the gospel. But as we will see, the road to Rome, the the journey to Rome is paved with even more suffering, even more tears, which is why he must continually take courage, as must we. And then four, walk in faithful obedience no matter the cost. Obedience not determined by circumstance or convenience, but a devotion to Christ. Christ, who we are trusting day in and day out as our only hope in life and in death. Church, the charge to each of us today, take courage. Take courage in Christ. Trust in his promises. Trust in his providence. And remain faithful to testify to the gospel of the grace of God, no matter the cost. Let's pray. Lord, there is much here to be considered. And oh, how I pray that we will not be a people who will hear such words as these and walk out the same way that we came in. Lord, may faithfulness mark our life Or may a desire and a devotion to Christ mark our life. And if our faithfulness takes our life, then Lord, may you be glorified through the life that we live. Oh Lord, in everything, whether it's in life or in death, Lord, help us to see Christ as our only hope, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.